We are back. You're back. Yep. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to GDG Seattle's event. And we're very excited to have you here with us. We, uh, for those of you who are new to GDG, um, we every time we have an event, we always kick it off with our code of conduct. GDG Seattle is an inclusive community where everyone is welcome uh, here to learn, practice, and share Google technologies, services, and platforms. Our motto is be excellent to each other. So if you see or experience anything different, please contact uh, me and the organizers. So um, tonight, we're very excited here to have uh, two, two talks and uh, walk through a code lab. First, Lawrence Moroni from Google is going to talk about what Google is doing with on-device machine learning. Then Jerry Kudrata, um, machine learning GD, is going to talk about TensorFlow Lite and Corel TPUs. And then in the end, I will walk through a TensorFlow like collabs. And someone was asking the question about downloads. I will answer your question through the chats. So now let's get started with our very first talk. Please welcome Lawrence Moroni from Google. Thank you, Margaret. And welcome, everybody, to this on-device uh, ML study jam from uh, the G folks in GDG Seattle. It's really cool to be able to do events like this, even like you know, we can't do them in person, but at least we've been able to find solutions to do uh, events like this. And I always love to come and speak with the community, meet up with all of you, try to answer your questions. And uh, so thanks to GDG Seattle and to Margaret and to Jerry for facilitating and everybody else who's been uh, involved in organizing it. I'm going to spend maybe 15, 20 minutes to just go through some of what we have at Google for on-device machine learning. I do tend to get a little bit long-winded, though, so if I go over time, please forgive me. And uh, But I'd like to just talk about what it is that we're doing, how we're thinking about it, and you know some of the reasons why we've made some of the decisions that we've made uh, behind machine learning, and in particular, on-device machine learning. And first of all is the term on-device machine learning is a little bit of a misnomer. And if you're new to machine learning, you might think, hey, you know, we can actually do the learning on the device itself. Uh, so the terminology is a little bit broken there. But what, we're, what I'm really going to be talking about is the inference um, on devices. So machine learning models created using machine learning as a discipline are typically created on your developer workstation or on something like Google Colab or you know stuff in the cloud, and you'll get a machine learning model. And then that model can be used on a device for inference. So the machine learning model is on the device, but the learning itself doesn't take place on the device. And I know that, le that leads to a lot of confusion and are people like kind of really thinking about, am I going to kill my user's battery by doing all this intensive machine learning on it? The answer to that is no. Um, we've been working on trying to drive a runtime that's very, very efficient so that your machine learning models will run on people's devices. And with very few exceptions, uh, there's a thing called federated learning and that would allow the learning to happen on the device, but that's very much a corner case. And so I'm going to be focused on on-device inference so that your machine learning models can be used on that. And now, the reason why we've been working hard on this is, well, when we start looking at the explosion in edge devices, uh, like the, there are more mobile devices now than there are desktop computers. And there are you know, an order of magnitude more embedded systems and microcontrollers than there are mobile devices. So we're seeing an explosion in the number of places where models can be run. And when you run models on these devices, interesting things happen. First of all, um, lower latency is required, right? You really want, you can't like, expect an inference to happen and then a round trip to the cloud and a result to come back. It happens on the device, it happens there, and it gives you an answer there and then. And as a result, that requires you to have the models running on the device instead of in some powerful cloud infrastructure. Secondly, as network connectivity, you don't always have the luxury of network connectivity, much less if you are worried about speed. Uh, Margaret and I were just chatting earlier on. We discovered that we're neighbors. And just last week, uh, there was a big storm here in Seattle where I lost power for nearly a day and a half and I had no network connectivity. You know, So it'd be nice if I was reliant on some kind of an application that that application and the machine learning model, if it was local to me without network connectivity, I could still do my job and get stuff done. And there are a, lumber, a number of great examples out there of where machine learning models have been used on mobile devices to detect crop diseases in the emerging uh, markets in the emerging world. And a lot of these places don't have good connectivity for mobile devices. So you can't exactly upload pictures, have an inference done in the cloud, and then a result sent back to you that you really do need to have the model working on the device. And then, of course, there's privacy. 
uh, that's when you have a personal device like your cell phone, that's a very personal device. And it's, you know, there's a there's an issue with like gathering data from that device and sending that to a third party to have an inference run on it. But if you're gathering data like sound or uh, video or anything like that, it's better if that's kept on your device and yours and yours alone so that you can, um, you know, you, your privacy is basically preserved. It's funny, there's a model that I'm going to be showing in a moment that I was using earlier on, and I'll explain an example of how privacy preservation could be an issue with that. Uh, so, for example, on device ML, the idea that we want to also drive is that we believe it's actually going to allow for a whole new generation of product types. Uh, think about what happened when the cell phone or the smartphone first came on the scene. You had a mobile computer that was loaded with sensors, had a camera, had GPS, had other things like that. And that opened up a new class of apps that didn't previously exist. We always like to joke at Google is that once upon a time, you know, you would say that you would never speak to strangers from the internet and you would never get into a stranger's car. Now with our phones, we will literally summon a stranger's car from the internet and get into it to take us where we want to go. We've, you know, the, there's that new generation of products and there's new generation of things that are happening that wasn't previously possible with the introduction of that device. And we believe with ML and with machine learning models that will allow for a whole new generation of products, things that you can do that you couldn't previously do. A couple of examples here is like with YouTube on the YouTube app that allows you to try on lipstick you know, and try on different cosmetic products to see what they look like. Think about how difficult that would be to program without machine learning, to try to figure out where your lips are in a video stream and to colorize them and them alone. You know, extremely difficult to do without a machine learning model. And as a result, not really possible to do because it would be infeasible. Or there's, you've probably seen Google Translate. This is one of my personal favorites. So like this, uh, this uh, whatever this thing is with a white face on it, is it milk? Is it paint? Is it something else? You know, that you could actually get a translation on your device right away. And I, prior to the pandemic, used to travel a lot. And this was my very favorite app and helped me survive in many countries. And another one that's just become recent was um, with uh, in some Google devices and some Pixel devices now, there's live transcription and sound notifications. So for example, you can turn this on and your phone will notify you if a baby is crying or if a dog is barking or the doorbell is ringing or something like that. And uh, it's what, 7.40 now, earlier on, I had turned this on and I was trying this out when I grabbed these screenshots and I had my phone in my pocket while I was washing the dishes. And I got, you can see one of the uh, notifications here was water running. My phone kept buzzing, telling me it could hear water was running. And then I realized that I have to be careful what I turn on and, and when I have it and when I'm using it and thinking again in terms of privacy. You know, it's like, you know, I would be very uncomfortable if I thought the sound of me in the kitchen was being uploaded to a Google server and a Google server was doing the classification. You know, but what was actually happening was this was a model that was local to my phone. So the sound, the recording of the sound around me and the conversation I was having with my family didn't get uploaded, but the local model was able to detect the water was running. But I probably want to turn that notification off when I'm doing the dishes because my phone buzzed me about 10 times. Okay, so all of these are made possible by something that we call TensorFlow Lite. And the idea of TensorFlow Lite, it's and we're going to be, uh, Jerry's going to be talking about it on Edge Devices later, and Margaret's going to be doing a workshop. But it's really, it's our framework for deploying ML. You know, if you take one word away from this slide, see it as the deploying ML. TensorFlow is what you'll use for creating your models, but TensorFlow Lite is what you'll use for deploying it on mobile and embedded systems. And I like to look at it as the three classes of mobile embedded system. The first one is the smartphone that I was talking about earlier on, Android or iOS. The second one are these increasingly common single board computers that run Linux. So things like a Raspberry Pi or a Coral Dev board. And then the final one are microcontrollers, something like the Arduino, something that's really tiny, uses very, very little power, and can be used for like a specific action rather than like a phone, which is a general purpose mobile computer. So starting with the smartphone, you know, we have like tons of production apps using TensorFlow Lite and using our machine learning globally. You know, apps from Google like Photos and Gboard and YouTube, but also apps from some of our partners. Um, so again, to, to create an app that was able to meet a scenario that would take you many thousands or hundreds of thousands of lines of code to write, but you might be able to do it in two or three lines of code with a trained model is really where ML is powerful. And just calling out YouTube here, for example, was the, uh, the training on makeup 
uh, example that I showed a moment ago with YouTube. So we see that ML models kind of fall into these classes uh, text, where it's a case of it's, if you can imagine text to be able to classify or predict text. Um, you can classify text, a, cla a classic, I almost said a classic classification, uh, is thinking about like toxicity in text. If you are creating a chat room or if you know, we have a chat going here, that to be able to detect things in the text, maybe that you, know, you don't want to have rendered in your chat room. You know, machine learning can be much more powerful for that than a whole bunch of if-then rules. Or even more powerful is sentiment in text. So for example, if you have a product and you want to see people tweeting about your product, are they saying good things or are they saying bad things? You know, again, machine learning, machine learning models around that are really important. Speech, of course, uh, to be able to recognize people's speech and a little demo of that I can do by turning on captions here. So now as I'm actually speaking, it's capturing my text and we're using a TensorFlow model here, capturing what I'm saying and then rendering it on the screen. And I always like to, if you've seen me talk before, I'll always use this one and I'll ask people if they know the second longest word in the English language. I'm not in front of an audience now where people can shout it out, but I usually do that. And the second longest word in the English language is anti-disestablishmentarianism. And one of the funny things about that, if you look closely to the stream, it will actually finish typing the word before I finish saying it, because it realizes at some point there's only one word that will match what I've actually said, and it's predicting that, and it's just going to render that. So I'll say it again right now. Three, two, one, anti-disestablishmentarianism. You see it finished it before I did, which I think is really cool. And that's the kind of speech model that I think could only be done using machine learning. Can you imagine listening to this stream and writing a bunch of if-then rules to try and render rule, try, try and render words from what I'm saying? It'd be really difficult. Uh, computer vision, obviously, is a huge one. And images, being able to see what's in an image, being able to do, pick the location of what's in the image, or people's gestures, or faces, or those kind of thing is a massive area for machine learning. Audio is uh, growing increasingly uh, important. We're finding a lot of audio scenarios. Uh, so to be able to classify, you're hearing a dog barking, or um, I've been looking at an app recently that was made in Japan that was designed for deaf children. And what it would do is it would like the things that are in the environment around them, when it would hear that sound, it would give them a nice picture of that so that they could interact with their environment really nicely. You hear a bird singing and you see a bird on your phone. You and I, I'm, I'm not deaf and like I'm able to hear a bird and maybe turn and look at it, but the child that didn't hear the bird singing at least could have like the bird rendered on their phone and things like that, which I thought was really cool. And then of course, there's like another area of machine learning is generating content, being able to generate video, text, audio, graphics, those kind of things. So if you go to tensorflow.org slash light, there's a bunch of examples that you can download and start playing with them right away. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on them here. But like, if you want to get a quick start in building an app and seeing how an app works that manages some of these uh, classes that I mentioned, like image classification or object detection, you can do it here. And you can see many of them are available, not just on Android and iOS, but also on Raspberry Pi. Uh, one technology that we've been working on and we're really excited about is MLKit. And the idea behind MLKit was, um, you know, it's really twofold. Number one, to get you up and running very quickly with common scenarios. And in some of these scenarios, you may not even build a model yourself. You may not touch a model ever again, but you're actually using machine learning. For example, for like face detection. Uh, is one of them here. Like, if you want to do face detection, instead of you worrying about building a machine learning model and trying to figure out how to train it and all of that kind of stuff, we've wrapped one in an API in MLKit and made that available to you. Uh, so there's a number of them, as you can see here. The uh, landmark detection one is particularly cool. Uh, but if you want to go beyond that and use your own custom model, like maybe you build a prototype with the turnkey one, but you realize the prototype is too general and you want to build a custom model for doing something, then you can also do that with MLKit to like serve that custom model to you. And one of the nice things about MLKit, if you've ever been a Firebase programmer, is uh, Firebase has this beautiful asynchronous API that calls you back like on success and stuff like that. And uh, MLKit is really, really useful at that. It's really great for you to program and to get up and running quickly with something that you're familiar with. The next place that we look at TensorFlow Lite running on, of course, is Linux-based devices like a Raspberry Pi or a Coral. And just one example here is like this is a, a robot from Ego, Ecovacs you know, that uses object detection so that this robot, which is a little bit like a Roomba, you know, won't end up sucking up your headphones and stuff like that. It can actually see them and detect them and work its way around them. 
Carl, Jerry's going to be talking a lot about Carl a little bit later, so I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail. But the idea behind Carl is um, that we provide accelerators uh, for embedded systems so that if your system, for example, like a Raspberry Pi board, uh, doesn't have like a GPU or the CPU you don't want to eat up with doing inference, you can actually use a Coral board as an edge TPU as, a, as an add-on to that so you can offload your machine learning tasks and running your models to that. And so some of the products, um, there's a dev board, of course, that you can start building them. There's the accelerator that I mentioned. And now there's other stuff like uh, I'm particularly excited about the ones on the right here uh, for sensing so that you can, for example, have an accessory board so you can have temperature, light, humidity sensing for IoT applications with machine learning built in. And then finally is the microcontroller. And so this is where we get into what we call tiny ML. And it's a special version of TensorFlow Lite that we call TensorFlow Lite Micro. And the idea behind this one is that you can shrink models down to like kilobytes or less uh, so that you can run uh, models on tiny devices like this that have a tiny battery um, and are designed to run for a long time. Uh, microcontrollers I see being a huge future for machine learning. Uh, imagine, for example, a camera connected to an alarm system that if you know somebody's uh, committing a crime and you see this on the camera, generally you have to have a human look at the screen, see what's going on, and push a button to generate an alarm. Uh, what if the camera itself was smart enough to do that? This is the kind of thing that you can start having once you're offloading machine learning into microcontrollers and you're building electronics around it. So microcontroller, it's a very small computer on a single circuit. There's no operating system required. It runs on the bare metal. And you know, it's uh, it's fast. It's it's an embedded system. And the idea is like you're not going to be building giant models that do general things, but you can change how you program these devices and you can build whole new classes of devices with it. Um, there is, if you're interested in tiny ML, there's a great book written by a Googler called Pete Warden and Daniel Sitniaki. And um, I teach a course on uh, Harvard's edX platform on TinyML. Go check that out if you want to learn more detail on how to do that for microcontrollers. So for example, um, even though this is a phone, uh, one great example is hot word detection. So that if you say, OK, Google, and your phone understands it, I have a speaker in the background. It might start speaking back to me because I just said the words. Um, the, there's actually a dedicated DSP in some of those devices to do that. It's not um, running TensorFlow Lite you know, and like using resources for that. There's some devices actually have that dedicated DSP, so they're using TinyML already. How to get started, you can see details here from Arduino. I think Jerry's going to go into some detail on that later. But you can build like a speech detection in five minutes uh, with an Arduino, whereas you can see in this case, like if you say there, there's a model trained for the words yes and no, and a little LED will light up green or red according to which ones you've tried. It's, it's kind of a lot of fun to do. So finally, just uh, just want to do a quick wrap up of one of the things that we've been working and where we're putting a lot of our investment um, over the last year and in the coming years, really optimizing models so that we can make them smaller, faster, and more battery efficient. So as you can imagine, particularly with uh, embedded systems and microcontrollers, optimization is extremely important. But it's not just for them. It's also for your mobile devices and your mobile apps. So some of the methods that we use is, obviously, there's a model architecture. We want to design it to be mobile optimized. There's a thing called quantization that I'll show in a moment that we want to apply to it. There's pruning, which is another technique I'll show in a moment that we want to apply to your models. And then if hardware accelerators are available on your models to make them easily accessible to developers. So to give an example of some of the um, mobile architectures, um, Inception and MobileNet are common ones that are used for image classification. And we found that you know, by applying some of these techniques that I mentioned, and I'll go into detail in a moment, things like um, MobileNet for inference, so that is how much time it takes for you to, once you've given the model an image, for it to come back and tell you this is a picture of a cat. You know, it's down to about 8.5 milliseconds, and we've increased the speed of that 37x uh, with some of the techniques that I've been talking about, as well as shrinking the models. So the mobile net model, and if you're not familiar with it, this can recognize a thousand different classes of thing: cats, dogs, airplanes, trucks. You know, that kind of stuff. Once given a picture, and being able to recognize a thousand of the models only 22 megabytes. So the concept of quantization is, if you're familiar with machine learning, a lot of uh, neurons and machine learning and the math that neurons use are based on float 32. And the thing is that the, um, the, the, the transform from these to the actual classes 
you know, you don't need the huge range that you have in a float 32 for that. You can actually do it with smaller, uh, a smaller number like an int eight. So it's trying to render that with these uh, these histograms here where like, you know, a classification that looks like this between the minimum and the maximum with a lot of wasted white space here could actually be changed into just like 256 values in an int eight like this. And if we have this across all of the neurons and all of the parameters in a neural network, we can massively shrink the size of the neural network with very little or no loss in accuracy. So quantization and tools for quantization is something that we've been working on for mobile developers. And just to give an example here, um, when we looked at the baseline of several common models, MobileNet 1, 2, and ResNet, you know, when they were using floats for their internal parameters, you know, the baseline that we were seeing here on accuracy was like about 71%, for example, for MobileNet. But we changed the quantization after training so that we lost all, we threw away all that information in that white space. We lost a tiny little bit of accuracy, as you can see here. It was only about 1.5%. With MobileNet V2, it was only half a percent. And with ResNet, it was like 1 20th of a percent. But we didn't lose any, uh, we increased performance and we just lost that tiny little bit of accuracy. So it's a really lovely trade off. Uh, secondly, pruning. Um, it's very similar to dropouts, if you're familiar with neural networks and if you're familiar with training them. But the idea with pruning was like, instead of like just dropping out neurons, we could just say, um, some of these neurons, let's fill them with zeros. And a quick summary, if you're not familiar with neural networks, is we imagine every one of these neurons is a function. And this function generally has two parameters called a weight and a bias. It takes its input values, it multiplies the input values by the weight, and then it adds the bias. So for example, say you're classifying an image that has 100,000 pixels in it. Those 100,000 pixels all have values. Each one of those values is passed into each one of these functions. Each one of these functions then does all of that multiplication and all of that addition. And as a result, it can be very, very slow. So what we found is what the idea of pruning is like, you know what, for a whole bunch of these, just set them to zero. Uh, so if you're multiplying something by zero and you're adding zero, that's computationally very fast because you just set it to zero. And then everything downstream of that is going to be receiving a zero instead of multiple input values. So for example, like this neuron here is receiving input from four neurons. So in, like, for example, if we had pruned two of those, we know that two of those are zeros, so we can ignore them. So already it has um, half of the input data coming into it that it would have had previously. And if you can imagine the, the chain effect of that, the snowball effect of that can carry on greatly. And the interesting thing is with the research that we've been doing into this, that it doesn't have a huge impact on accuracy if we do it well. So we get smaller models, um, our tensors can be compressed and we get faster models because there's a lot less mathematics going on inside the neural network itself. And here's results that we found, for example, with a mobile net. So looking at what's called top one and top five, that on this is a hard diagram to read, but on the left of the diagram is when there's no pruning. So um, we didn't touch any of the neurons. We kept all of the weights and biases within them. And it was 89.5% accurate. This part of the diagram, if you go on the x-axis, is 0.5. And that means we threw away half of the neurons, or we set half of them to zero. And what actually happened is there was no impact at all on the accuracy. You know, when we started getting rid of more, like at this point, we're losing like 75% of them. We went down from 89.5% accuracy to 88.5% accuracy. And in what's called the top five, sorry, that was the top five accuracy, and it's when the top one accuracy, you know, we started with no pruning, would have 70.6%. At pruning half of them, we lose about 1% accuracy down to 69.5. So with a bit of experimentation, you know, and looking at your model and doing this pruning, using the pruning tools, you can shrink your model, you can make it faster, you can make it more battery efficient, but you can actually do it without necessarily losing accuracy. Hardware acceleration is the last part. And uh, so some devices that have hardware acceleration. So for example, if we're looking at something called MobileNet 1, we did a measure on a CPU to, to see uh, 37 milliseconds to do inference. With CPU with 2.8x, um, with using quantized, flex, sorry, quantized fixed point. So if you remember the quantization I showed earlier on to bring it down to an int 8, we could actually increase by 2.8x. When we used OpenCL, I won't go into the details of that now on a GPU, uh, we're actually able to increase it by 5.2x to 7 milliseconds. When using an edge TPU, which is a device that can be used for additional acceleration, we brought it down to 3.2 milliseconds. 
And then we're using something called a Hexagon DSP. Again, it's a dedicated hardware accelerator, may not be available to everybody, but it could bring the inference down to 2.8 milliseconds. So straight CPU, 37 milliseconds, could be optimized all the way down to like 2.8 milliseconds using quantization, using pruning, and using dedicated hardware. So that's a quick summary of everything that we've been working on, some of the strategy behind it, the vision that we have in Google for uh, driving machine learning at the edge and driving machine learning on mobile, and more importantly, to in improve the tool chain for developers so that you can start building them. Uh, my current role at Google is that tool chain is to kind of drive that. And like my, my vision for the year and my mission for the year is really to be focused laser on developers so that we can make a better experience for you to be able to build for these devices and to build whatever that next generation of applications is. So with that, I'll say thank you. And I know we have a few minutes for questions before we move on to Jerry. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, are there any questions? If anybody have questions, feel free to type it through the chat. I don't see any questions so far. OK. Um, so I can join the chat room. And if anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them in there. OK. That sounds good. And uh, thank you, Lawrence. Thank you, Margaret. Thanks, everybody. OK, next up is uh, Jerry's talk. Please welcome Jerry Carata for the next talk. Hey, guys. How's it going? So tonight, I want to talk to you a little bit, kind of taking off and somewhat, I guess I should have checked with Lawrence a little bit more. We have a little bit of overlap on our talks, but not too much. But anyway, uh, there's only so much you can do when you're doing Matili Flight. So I want to talk to you about TF Flight and the application of Coral TPUs to that and the impact on our intellig speed and intelligence at the edge. So, you know, as developers, we're used to doing this, right? We we're used to having a machine that has like a boatload of memory, right? If you go and buy a laptop, you're a machine learning developer. So you can't just get one with 16 gigabytes or something like that. You have to get the 32 gigabyte one or 64 gigabytes. And then you got to stuff this really, really powerful GPU card in it so that you can train the model on that device. And then you can deploy it and you can run it. However, is that really what we want to focus on? Maybe we'd like to focus on these other platforms, such as phones and the single board computer, this one being a Raspberry Pi, but there are dozens of them out there that you can find. And things like this uh, little computational engine over here that we have, Why, as developers, should we care about those devices and doing our ML on those devices? Well, let's take a look. Um, there are studies out there that show a graph like this. If we look, first of all, we see that desktops and servers, there's about 100 million of them projected in the not too distant future. But if then if we start looking at phones and intelligent devices like those single board computers, and those microcontroller-based systems, we see there's just this large proliferation. So if we're looking at where our development efforts should be and where our career maybe goals should be, we really should be focused on these areas because there's a lot of growth in them and there's a lot of you need for those skills. Now, what is unique about those things? If we start looking at it from a resource perspective, we see a number of things. Um, you know, we don't have a lot of memory. We don't have a lot of storage. We don't have a lot of expansion compared to that laptop that we showed where we can just buy things. Or if we even had a desktop, we could just stick cards in to get these things. Uh, our phones sometimes don't have the greatest connections. And it gets even worse when you go to dedicated devices. And there are other constraints. There's cost. If you're going to deploy a number of these, they can't cost $1,000 each. They have to toss tens of dollars or maybe $100. There's sizing problems. There's thermal limitation problems. 
um, and environmental problems. So imagine if you had a box in a field that was going to look at bugs going by and decide, are those helpful bugs or are those pest type bugs? And make a decision because maybe if a farmer, if it sees pests, it wants to send a farmer an email saying, or some sort of message saying, hey, I'm seeing locusts. This is not a good thing. You should get out here and do something about this right away. We also have power limitations for doing all that because maybe that box in the field is powered by a solar panel and a small battery just so it can run at night. And then the one we wanted to spend a bit of time on, we have limited computing power because it's one thing to say that, oh, I see something there that may not need a, a lot of computing power, but then to say, what is that bug that you see? It's a ladybug, it's okay. If it's locust, that's bad and I need to tell somebody about it. And then Lawrence touched on this, but I don't think we can say it enough. Security and privacy. When we're doing these things, we don't want to send data any further than we have to. I have a friend that has a company that makes security systems and specifically smart cameras. And his cameras can not only tell gee, there's somebody coming up to your door, but it can kind of make an inference as, hey, this guy is doing something he shouldn't be, like he's taking your mail from you. But you shouldn't be sending all those pictures all the time, only when you need to know that that's the guy that's taking your mail. Okay. So how do we deal with that? We need some sort of framework. And this is kind of self-evident now, but we need some sort of framework that we can still develop on all those big machines and everything using our familiar tools, editors, and things like that, and all those skills we developed, and create models that are efficient and easy to put on those devices. And then in a lot of cases, we need to have model hardware acceleration that helps our model run faster at the edge. Now, the framework, that's pretty easy. Lawrence touched on this, but I'm going to hit it again just because I think it's really important. TF Lite is not a generalized framework for creating uh, neural network models. That's what the full blown TensorFlow is for. TF Lite is for taking that model and then working with it to get it to run on a device. Specifically, we do that using the TensorFlow framework, which we're familiar with. But we also then, when we move to those devices, we can use things like Xcode, Android Studio for phones and things like that. And in familiar languages, Swift, Java, Kotlin on phone, Python and C. And, oh, my thing popped up. Go away, go away, thank you. And it also supports machine learning accelerators on many platforms. So that brings us to the question, we're used to using like a uh, NVIDIA board or something to accelerate. What do we have in these spaces? Well, let's take a look at this. We have TF Lite support across all these devices. So whether we're on a phone or a single board computer or a microcontroller, we have TF Lite support. We don't, what we don't have on phones is something called the Coral Runtime support, and I'll get to that in just a moment. <clears throat> but what else do we have on a phone? Well. Your phone is used to play games and things like that, so it has ML acceleration. Let's take a look at a single board computer. When we have a single board computer, like I said, we have TF Lite, but we don't have, when we have the Coral Runtime, we can run on it because we have a full op operating system, a Linux derivative, and we can also get acceleration from a TPU accelerator because most of those single board computers don't have that capabilities. Moving over to our microcontroller, we have a special version of TF Lite, we call TF Lite for microcontrollers that we can run, but we don't have support for these coral devices, nor do we normally have machine learning acceleration. Although over time, I suspect we'll get more of that as we get more and more things to these smaller devices. So for this talk, we're gonna kind of focus in this area. So think single board type computer, with Coral Runtime Support and the Coral TPU Accelerator. Okay, so with Coral devices plus these accelerators, we get this massive gain in performance. 
And let me, let me give you just another example of what I mean by that massive gain in performance. Here's some models, and we can look at how fast they ran on a CPU and then on the edge TPU. And then we can look at the speed up. It's pretty impressive. And then we can look at uh, our ML model acceleration. We get that by using an 8-bit integer implementation of a TPU. And I really do mean those big TPUs that you're used to seeing in the data centers with a shrunk down version. It's still doing a systolic array, which is how they get their performance. But it's done in a, in a way on a shrunk down version that still gives us that performance, but at an extremely low power consumption, something on the order of two watts. We also get various software libraries, and we get support, obviously, for TF Lite, but also the Cloud, Cloud Vision ML, which is a really, really cool tool, which lets you go up to Google Cloud, build your model, and then just with the click of a button say, oh, push that model to a Coral device. No, click another button, say, push it to a phone. Oh, I meant an iPhone. Oh, now I mean an Android phone. So it's really, really easy to create these models. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the hardware, though, that, that the Coral team has put together to enable us to do this. First, they have prototyping devices. First, this is a USB stick here. Um, and I really wish that thing wouldn't come up. But <laughs> Uh, a USB stick that'll cost $60 that we can plug in. It has USB 3. USB, -T, USB 2 would be too slow. It just wouldn't push the data fast enough, so you have to have USB 3. And we'll even talk about that. It, USB 3 isn't quite fast enough in some scenarios. The second device, this is a Coral dev board. And if you look, and if you're at all familiar with small computers, this looks a lot like a Raspberry Pi. It's so much like a Raspberry Pi that you can take a case, some cases from a Raspberry Pi, and plug them in because these pin configurations are, are identical. Now, this also, like a Raspberry Pi, has GPIO pins, which means you can control things with it. What's different is this part here. And let's take a look at that as we go from prototyping to actual components that somebody could buy and put on a board. Over here on the left is we have what's called a SOM, system on a, mod system on a module. And this has a CPU, a GPU, the edge TPU, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and security in a pluggable board. So if you're an integrator, somebody that needs to build something to use these, you can buy this board Put it on your, put it on a inside your system, and pretty much have everything you need to run a Linux distribution on it, plus have acceleration, plus security, plus Wi-Fi and Bluetooth right there in one box. In the center, we have a PCIe board, a mini PCIe board, which a lot of third-party controllers have those slots to stick in things like SSD. Now, in addition to an SSD, now you can plug in a Coral Accelerator. And on the right, we have the actual Coral Accelerator, which they'll sell you. And you can build your own boards from scratch and just solder those onto them and give yourself acceleration. And notice the small size. It's amazing the power you can get for one of those. Okay. So let's talk about how we deploy these models. We can start with an existing TensorFlow model that we have. This could be one you created, someone gave you, however, wherever it came from. We can then convert that via the TensorFlow Lite converter to what we call a flat buffer. And we can do that quantization that Lawrence talked about that's compressing it from a floating point 32 version, perhaps, down to an 8 bit integer version. And then we can deploy that compressed file out to our Coral device. Alternately, oops, I had some things there. Alternately, oop, let me go backwards. Oh, yeah. Never mind. Sorry about that. Um, and here's the code to do all that. We can instantiate the converter. 
And then from the converter, we can specify our quantization parameters. There's different types. There's pre and post quantization, training quantizations. And then we convert the model. And then we save the model out to disk and then copy it to our device. Now let's take a little bit closer look. Sorry about that again. Uh, let's take a look at other deployment ways. We can go with a pre-trained model. The Coral team has provided classification and detection models that we can put up there and use. They're already done for us. So some of those models that Lawrence was mentioning, there are already versions of those that they've gone through all the trouble to put out there. And if that works for you, that's great. The other thing you can do, though, is you can use transfer learning. So let's say one of those models detects people, books, what have you not, and you really don't, you like that you have that model, but what you want to do is really detect whether it's a dog or a cat. You can retrain that model with transfer learning and train it, train just part of the model, a very small slice of the model, and get it to recognize dog and cats and do that in a fraction of the time that it would take you to train the entire model. Then you could do the conversion and create the compressed TF flight file and push it to the device. Now, we've got our model trained, so what does it look like when we want to run it on our device? Well, this is what it looks like. We first need to create an instance of the interpreter and load it up with our model. Then we need to allocate some tensors specifically to get our input and output. So we're going to send data in, it's going to, model's going to run, it's going to produce data out. And here's what that looks like. I'm sending in these values. It's, I'm invoking the model. And then in this particular case, this is an object detection model. So what it gives me back out are the bounding boxes around the objects in the image that it worked on, the classes of those images, and then the confidence scores it has in those. And now let's take a quick look at one of those in action. This is our setup. Over here, I have a Raspberry Pi. Here I have the Coral TPU uh, USB accelerator. And here's a common LED, uh, webcam, which probably goes for three times as much as it did before coronavirus. OK, inside the code in this model, it's going to essentially do this. While there are frames there, it's going to detect the objects in each frame. In other words, it's going to make that call and get back from the from our model, a list of the objects that it found. Then for each object, it's going to draw a box around the object, label the box with the object class, add a probability, display a frame, and then read the next frame. The thing to note here is this is where the time is taken detecting it. So frame rate that we'll see when we run this is really a function of the model's speed at detecting objects. And I wrote this so that I can turn off and on the TPU accelerator. So without the TPU accelerator on, we're running on the, G the CPU in the Raspberry Pi, which is a decent CPU, but it is nowhere near as fast as running that model on our TPU accelerator. So let's take a look let's at this. Let's get our application up and running on the Pi. Notice we can press the T key to switch between running the model on the CPU and GPU. Let's get that camera output centered. And let's check the frame rate. Right now we have it doing object recognition on the Pi CPU. And we see we are getting about four frames per second. As I pan around the room, you can see the model detects objects but the frame rate is slow and jerky because the model is running on the Pi CPU. This is because we must wait for the model running on the CPU to detect objects before we can draw the box around the detected objects and then get and process the next available frame. In processing at four frames per second, everything looks like it's slow motion. And the video looks jerky as we pan around the room. But if I come back to the keyboard and press the T key, 
I can toggle to using the Coral USB Accelerator to run the model and return the predicted results. As we discussed before, the Coral TPU lets our model detect objects much faster, and as a result, we can process about 20 frames per second, about five times faster than on the CPU, and we see what a difference that makes. Imagine this model was used to recognize objects coming down a conveyor belt so they could be routed. Using only the CPU, the model might miss objects, which could result in misrouted packages. But with the TPU, the detection is much faster and smoother. And even with USB 3, the speed of the Pi's USB interface is the gating factor. When the TPU is running on a Coral TPU dev board, which provides direct access to the TPU, you can process close to 60 frames per second. Okay. So let me wrap up from there. Some final thoughts here. TF Flight is this powerful framework, it lets us do a lot of things and lets us leverage TensorFlow and its development environment to do our work. Second, it performs inference on a wide variety of platforms. The Coral TPUs that we saw are just one, but we can also work on you know, things all the way down to microcontroller. But if we do work on those Coral TPUs, we can use all sorts, we can do inference at amazing and high performance and at low cost. And one more thing, building stuff that does this is fun. It's fun to build a robot that actually does something, does something in the real world or does something to help somebody. So get one of these and have some fun. And with that, thank you very much for your kind attention and I'll kick it back over to Margaret. Great, thank you. Thank you, Jerry, for your talk. Um, are there any questions people want to ask? Okay, so I don't see any questions, but I'm sure people are going to start typing. Um, thanks again, Jerry. No problem. And you can answer the questions as they start typing through the okay. stream. So I'm going to, oh, okay. So let's just answer one question. Is there any TFLI simulator environments we can test it on desktop PC before deploying to mobile devices? Do you want me to take that one? Yeah, go ahead and take that. I'm not, yeah. you can, I know you can plug those, the accelerators in, but I'm not as familiar with yeah. that. So yeah, if you want to test a model um, on your desktop, on your development de device, the, the TF Lite interpreter uh, is available as a Python library. So you can just pip install it. You don't have to install the entire TF Lite tool chain. So once you've converted your model to TF Lite format, if you want to test it on your desktop in your test desktop environment, you can do it that way. And then of course, if you're developing for like Android or iOS, uh, the simulator on iOS and the emulator on Android, uh, the TF Lite runtime also runs on those. So you can test your, um, your models in the emulated environment. Great, thank you, Lawrence. Thanks, Lawrence. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna go to my talk now and then people feel free to keep asking Jerry and Lawrence questions. Okay, great. Um, so my turn. Um, thanks again, Jerry, for your talk. Uh, again, I'm Margaret. I'm the lead organizer of uh, GDG Seattle. Uh, I'm also a machine learning GDE, and I uh, also spend a lot of time working on TensorFlow Lite and uh, applications. So next, I want to walk you through some code labs. But before I do that, I just want to quickly uh, remind everyone, like, what are the main components of TensorFlow Lite? The converter and the interpreter, which both Lawrence and Jerry already mentioned. And if you just get started working with TensorFlow Lite, chances are that's what you're going to be working with. There are ops and kernels and also interface to hardware accelerations. And uh, um, I 
um, also want to mention the past year, the TensorFlow team has spent a lot of time creating uh, lots of new tools to make developers' life easier uh, for deploying uh, models to um, the mobile devices and uh, edge devices. Okay, so just today, um, the um, TensorFlow just announced that this toolkit 0 0.1 uh, gets announced, and this will make deploying TensorFlow Lite models to mobile devices much easier. It works cross-platform with Java, Python, C++, and Swift APIs. And what is in this toolkit? It consists of a bunch of tools that the TensorFlow Lite team created last year. It has the Task API. I believe that uses C++ is a pretty fast, and it makes the um, deploy models to your Android apps or iOS apps much uh, easier. Like you don't have to write the code for um, how to load the model and running the inference and pre-processing the data, etc. And it has also the support library. The support library handles the a lot of things like a pre-process and post-process of the uh, data. And then the metadata library, which I will talk about the ML model binding or rely on using the metadata library, uh, as well as code gen uh, for generating the classes and custom ops and model maker and ML model binding. And I have included, uh, um, I will include the links here for you that you can take a look at yourself. So last year I wrote um, a two part uh, tutorial. The first one is to use the TensorFlow Lite model maker to create a image classifier to be able to classify icons. And I, when I wrote the um, tutorial at that time, the model maker supported image and text classification. I believe right now it supports more, perhaps a recommendation as well. And then the second part of my tutorial is about how to use ML model binding for uh, importing the TF Lite models um, in Android Studio. So I just want to mention real quick, the model maker actually makes a TF Lite model that can be used by the ML model binding. So now I want to walk you through a code lab. Um, so if you have a browser and just go either, I, I know this URL is really uh, long, so let me just um, type this URL into the chat window. Okay. So this um, lab um, will help to create a image classifier that classifies five types of flowers, daisy, dandelion, roses, sunflowers, and tulips. So some of you who have been to the GDG Seattle code lab before we've had, anybody remember TensorFlow for Poet? Um, anyways, so the TensorFlow po for Poet a while ago also does the classification of these cla these flowers. However, back then we had to run the script, uh, a Python script via command line, and which you really don't couldn't really see what is going on other than you run the script and you can get the result. And so today we're going to use the model maker and uh, use Python code in CoLab. And then we're gonna use ML model binding in Android Studio to easily import a TF Lite um, uh, model. Okay, I'm looking at the chat. Yes, Brittany and Dian Chi said they remember the TensorFlow for poets. So, so this lab is kind of like TensorFlow for poet V2, much better. 
or maybe V3. Okay, so let's get started. Um, you have that link and uh, you should be over here, right? The introduction part is basically telling you what we're building. There are two main parts. The first part is to actually make the model. It's just an image classifier. Second part is to use the model in the Android app. To make the model, you click on open the collab. Okay. So once you click on open the collab in your browser, you will see this collab here where you can execute, right? So what I usually do is I will go to file and save a copy in drive, and then I work off of my copy. So I have already prepared the copy um, here. And the first thing you want to do is to um, to install uh, TFLA model maker. Okay. So one thing to note is that they do not use this line that it's in the code lab. I tried it. I got all kinds of errors about missing TensorFlow.js and this and that, the other. So use this pip install TFLA dash model that model maker okay so i'm gonna type it in here just so you have this nine of code make sure you do that and then to execute this for those of you who are not familiar with collab you will click on this to execute or you can do shift enter or um, control enter to execute Right. After you install the TensorFlow Lite model maker, uh, it might ask you to restart your runtime. And if you, so you can just say yes, click on restart the runtime. And then we will execute this cell. In here, you're just importing NumPy, TensorFlow, and a bunch of other modules related to the um, TensorFlow Lite model maker. So just import. Now, next, we're going to get the data. You're downloading the data, the flowers data from this URL here. And I have in modified the code. I put uh, this cache directory to be the current directory so that I can easily see uh, where it is. Otherwise, it puts it in some other default Keras directory. So you click on this, and it's downloading the data. And you can either um, you know look at where you're here and you can uh, check what folders are there or you can also see it from here uh, the directories tab and you see that data sets gets downloaded there's a flower photos five classes daisy dandelion roses sunflowers and tulips etc etc okay uh, or you can just execute this to see eh, the same as that from the GUI. Um, just want to mention these data that we downloaded from the internet. You could organize your images like this, you know, into a folder, uh, whether it's cats versus dogs or some other classes that the objects you uh, you want to classify. It, you just need to point to the data folder you have. So now that we have the data, it's really simple. You say, OK, data, um, you create it with using this image classifier data loader from the folder, which is the image path. The image path is the, you know, the flower folders here. And then we do a training and train and test data split. And we split, specify the split as 0 0.9. And you execute the cell. So uh, anybody actually trying to run this uh, notebook? OK, so now we have the training and test data uh, split. A, we just called image classifier dot create give the training data uh, as the input, and then um, that will do the training with five epochs. 
Now the five epochs is the default. You can also overwrite the Okay, so Brandon, you are following. Okay, good. Good, Brittany is following. Great, great. Okay, uh, so the default is five epochs. You could override it to make it run longer. Um, you can change the epochs. And there's a couple other things you can change as well. For example, this model um, by default is uh, uh, efficient net. I think it's the... Let me see what the, so the default is efficient net light zero. And then you can switch it to model net V2 or ResNet 50. So there's a bunch of other things you could change as well. Um, I'm just going through uh, like, for example, you know, the input shape and batch size, et cetera, you can change. Okay, so I'm coming back to this collab here and it finished training really fast. And uh, after five epochs, it's uh, this is the accuracy, not bad. And uh, by the way, it here, you just call this classifier.create under the hood, it actually uses transfer learning. Okay, that's why I was mentioning the, you know, what the default model is. And then you run this cell, model.create to get the lost accuracy here on the test data. And, and then um, over here, the model.export it just is specifying where you want to export the TensorFlow Lite model. And then you click on this. Uh, I already done this before, so I won't try download another one. You just execute the last line. You will get a .tf Lite model. In this case, you call it model.tf Lite, but you can call it whatever, right? So that is really simple, right? You know, I walk through this in what, five minutes? Now, granted the data is quite simple, right? But still the code is pretty simple, right? Everything, you are not worrying about the data pre-processing. You're not worrying about specifying the model architecture. You know, you're basically is just doing call, um, a method to split the data and then call another method to train it. And that's it. Okay, thanks, Lawrence. Okay, so anybody successfully finished this lab and got a model.tf light file? Just if anybody finished, please let me know in chat. Oh, what's an epoch? Okay. Um Epoch is one pass that uh, we're going through all the training data and uh, trying to train the model. That's uh, Epoch. Great, Brittany finished, yay. So, you know, I, I feel like if there are some other labs, if I'm walking through making a uh, classifier, you know, some of, some of you have attended my collab before, right? I walked through the fashion MNIST and you train. Even that simple fashion MNIST, I have to go through like data pre-processing, shape and normalization, blah, blah, blah. Th this is like, okay, you don't have to worry about anything. Everything's handled for you. Now, boom, you've got a TF uh model. Okay. Great, for those of you who finished a great job. Now I'm gonna move on to talk about the Android part. Now there's also collab uh, after you get this .tf Lite model, there should be another collab. If you go to uh, Google Code Lab and if you go to like TensorFlow and 
you should be able to find one that's about like implementation on iOS. But today I'm going to talk about Android. Okay. So for the Android one, I understand not everybody is an Android developer and you may not have uh, Android Studio uh, installed, but I just want to walk through and finish up this lab and to show you how easy it is to uh, implement a model uh, here. So what you do is at the start one, all you have to do is right click on start. Uh, once you actually, let me, let me back up a little bit uh, before I jump there. So we have done this collab and got a .tf like model, right? The next step is to uh, implement this to Android. So you just need to do a git clone of this repo. Um, and then you can set up the Android skeleton app. Basically it has two parts. The Android app has two modules. One is the start module, which doesn't have everything. Finish is like, it already has the answer in there in case you get stuck, right? So all you have to do is right click on the module and go to new, go to other, go to TensorFlow Lite model here. And all you have to do is to find your model that you downloaded and, you know, pretend I, selected the dots, right? I, I selected this and all you have to do is just click on finish. And and you can select this, add this uh, um, using the GPU delegate here as well, right? So I'm not gonna do that here. Otherwise you have to sit here and wait for this thing to finish processing. So that's basically what the finished part is. Once I click on yes, submit, what happens is that the TF line model gets import it and when you finish you're going to see a screen like this um, telling you what the model name is the description um, the vi the version the author and the tensor shape blah 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 etc cetera, etc cetera. all of this is actually specified in the metadata when you train the model now i walk you through using the model maker to train the model and uh, we didn't have to worry about the metadata and the reason why is because the model data, the model maker itself already handled the metadata um, but like i worked on some other project where when uh, i was trying to train the model and convert the model there i had to specify specifically after i trained the model i have to take that .tfi and then run through a script to add the metadata in order to do this easy import, okay? But model maker already handled that for you. And imports the uh, ML, um, creates this ML uh, folder and add the .tf Lite model there. Uh, for those of you who have done some TF Lite work on Android before, you probably remember that you had to uh, in the past, you had to create manually a assets folder, manually place the TF Lite file there. So with this ML model binding, you don't have to do that manual process, okay? Now, another thing that this thing is doing is also in the, um, I believe it generates a, a file. Okay, I think it's the flower model.java. This is the generated class, okay? So without looking through all the details, for those of you who have worked with TensorFlow Lite model before, you know how tedious it is to match up the shape and whatnot, load the model and threading and different things you have to worry. Now you don't have to worry about it. By me, all I did was, uh, you know, like this. Um, import step, right? Oh, this code is already generated for you. So how is everyone doing? Uh, 
Okay, someone asking, is it only for beta version of Android Studio? When I wrote my uh, tutorial last year, uh, down that icon classifier, uh, at that time, it was only a beta version of Android Studio. However, right now, uh, no, not the, the, you don't have to use a beta version, just the, right. So like Yinchi said, just the 4.1, the stable one. Uh, so if you just, your latest Android Studio version should work and should contain the, uh, the ML model binding feature. Brittany said, curious what the Android Studio setting configuration or installation folder should be. Settings. I, I don't know. Installation. I, I, I'm not quite sure where the settings configure installation folder be. I'm not sure about that question. So uh, by the way, at the end of today's event, I'm gonna share with you the uh, our machine learning study jam um, Slack, so we can continue our discussion there, okay? So once you finish this, you can go to, you know, depending on which one you're working on. If you're working on the start one, you successfully imported the TFI, you can do this one. But I'm going to just try this one and then, you know, the Pixel 2 and I can just try to run finish. I can try to run this and build and deploy this to my Android. And after that, you should have um the app running so i'm uh, sorry i'm trying to get this connected somehow my phone is not connecting I guess I was brave enough to do everything live so far. Did anybody get your yours working? <laughs> always brave to do a live demo. Yep, I'm always very brave to do live demo. Everything worked fine. And they, my phone was connecting before, up until now. When I need to show it. Anyways, so I'm not able to connect my device through Visor for some reason. And because I was gonna show you that the app actually works and can detect flowers. Okay. <laughs> okay, anybody get yours working? Yep, that's what I'm trying. I'm gonna kill the visor and restart it again. Ah. Uh, it's connecting now. Great. Yay. 
Okay. Everybody can see my screen, yeah? So um, this is the one that I was showing you, the finished one, right? And, you know, I have this couple of pictures on my slides. I pointed to this one. And you can see there are these flower classes, right? Clearly it's identified as daisy. And this one is uh, roses and sunflowers and tulip and uh, dandelion, right? So it works out pretty well, you know, considering that it was like five minute training. Uh, I think the data set is actually quite small as well. And accuracy 93%, not bad. And so it was pretty good that we were able to train the model so quickly. So. Okay, so that was the lab and uh, Brittany says, very cool. Thank you. Um, so that's the lab for those of you who were not, you know, I went through it so fast, right? And if you're not able to finish, feel free to um, play with it when you, later on after the event. And I also want to point out to you, um, I'm going to include this information. It's not in my site, but I also want to point out um, to you is that um, actually I did include these, this one here, but I will include the link here. Um, I encourage you to take a look at my um, notebook that I wrote on the icon classifier because this notebook that I, I wrote has more details in here uh, in terms of visualization of the data, in terms of how to further customizing the model maker. And I wanna also look at the, my data split real quick. I thought I also did a, yeah. I also did a more complicated data split. So the example I walked you through just did a um, train and test. My my notebook actually I did the training, validation, and test split. So and and I also had more information about how to customizing uh, the the model called the model that create part. And I also have more information on how to change out the pre-trained model. So I want to point that out for you to you to uh, make sure you take a look. And another thing is at the bottom of this this notebook, um, I also changed it uh, a bit. Where go take a look at the documentation here on the image classic uh, fire. You know the the official document documentation on model maker. It also has a lot of more uh, good information as well. And uh, take a look at the code. Uh, today I was running uh, some errors and I just looked through this page and I found my answer, right? So go dig into the code of the model maker and I drill into these packages and look at how the code is written, right? So that's what I encourage you to do and play with the, the code. So after that, you know, the, the model maker and the model uh, ML model binding, it's very simple. If you wanna learn more, uh, something more complicated, you can look at three of my uh, applications that I wrote and collaborated with other ML GTEs. The first one is Selfie to Anime. And second one is a cartoonizer, both of which are using GANs. So you can learn how to implement GANs on Android. And then the third one, the background stylizer, actually uses the um, two machine learning models. The first one is segmentation, and the second one is uh, um, a style transfer. In first, we segment the foreground from the background, and then we apply the style transfer only to the background. Okay, so I encourage you to take a look at that. And finally, take a look at the awesome TensorFlow Lite repo that I put together. It has uh, a list of models, apps, and tutorials, and a lot of learning resources for you to learn more about TensorFlow Lite.
And if you have a um, any questions, please join our Slack. And I'm gonna make sure. Uh, let me just um, copy and paste this into the chat so that you actually get this. By the way, I noticed that one person on um, the chat is keep posting a bunch of comments that's not so uh, relevant. So I encourage you, if you do post a comment, make sure it's actually going to benefit other people's learning. Okay? You know, our motto is to be excellent to each other. Um, if you post a bunch of comments that are not so re relevant, it's almost feel like you are just trolling the event. Okay, so join the Slack uh, workspace and go to the Undevice Machine Learning channel to ask your questions as you work through uh, these collabs or new collabs or new tutorials. And I thank you very much for listening to my talk. And apologize for the little trouble for the uh, live demo, but I know I'm very brave for trying live that de live demo. But I myself learn a lot through just hands on and uh, uh, live demos. I hope you enjoy that. And uh, if you want to learn more about TensorFlow Deep Learning and on device machine learning, please follow me on uh, Twitter, Medium, and uh, GitHub. So now I think that is the end of our event. And uh, I want to thank everybody for um, coming to our event today. And Jerry, are you there? Hello, Jerry. I'm still there, Margaret. <laughs> oh, okay. So um, yeah, I don't see your camera, but anyways, Oh, there. Um, there, there you are. Uh, Lawrence had to leave earlier, but I hope you all enjoyed interacting uh, with uh, everyone on the chat and asking Lawrence the questions and enjoy the talks by Lawrence, Jerry, and me. And uh, do you have anything else to add, Jerry? No, that was it. That was a lot of fun. And uh, it, it's really good to see so many people uh, so excited about this. Yeah, I know. I wish. Um, okay, Sean said, is there a way to join the Slack discussion? Yes. So let me just back up again. You know, I, I have already posted this link, the join Slack workspace link. If you go there, I believe there's a way for you to request to join. Uh, and then I will approve. Then you can just go to this on device machine ML channel. So I created just a bit of background. I created this workspace a few years ago. And we've run different study jams. For example, last year we had the uh, deep learning design pattern study jam with um, Andrew Furlich, right? And now we're running the undeviced machine learning study jam. And I imagine in the future we're going to have other study jams. Perhaps we can study how to get. TensorFlow Dev Certificate, how to get the GCP uh, Data Engineer uh, Certificate or ML Engineer Certificate. So, okay, great. Uh, I think that's the end of our event. Thank you all. Um, thanks again, Jerry, for speaking. And thank you all, everybody, for attending. Uh, I look. We look forward to seeing you in our future events. Okay. See you, brother. Bye. Bye.